Welcome. For MedSchool.com, I'm Dr. Sanjay Sharma, and this is a show called If I Knew Then, which is really based on a very simple premise. When everything is said and done, life comes down to a few key moments and decisions. Today on the show, we're thrilled to have Dr. Sharif Aldafrawi. He's the head of ophthalmology at the University of Toronto. He's a past president of the Canadian Ophthalmology Society, uh, and we're, uh, we're thrilled to have you. Welcome on the show, Sharif. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Thank you for um, So now, t- take, you know, we, we like to always start the show uh, going, going back to the beginnings. So, so just take me through where you were, uh, you know, kind of where you grew up, uh, and maybe just some of the important influences that you look back on now and you say these were, these were critical things in terms of uh, uh, exposures that have created who I am today. Well, you know, I, I was actually born in, uh, in Cairo, Egypt. My parents uh, emigrated when I was about uh, six years old. And it was related to the, to the political situation in, in the country at the time. And, um, and actually at that time, the president of Egypt wasn't allowing anyone to leave the country. But there was a small window where my family managed to get out and, uh, and uh, came to Canada. So um, my father was a petroleum engineer and... Uh, we ended up in Alberta because that's where the oil was. And so I did uh, my initial few years in Canada in between Calgary and Edmonton. And then he uh, uh, was brought on to the federal government and we moved to Ottawa. So I did um, most of uh, uh, my growing up in, uh, in Ottawa. And it was really uh, an unremarkable childhood, you know, as happy as childhoods can be. I mean, that's a traumatic period of life, but, you know, there's really nothing that uh, um, was hugely uh, effective. So, and, you know, at that, at that time, I mean, um, our, our, our family, we were new immigrants and, uh, um, and uh, we were not, certainly not well, well off, but uh, uh, well off, uh, you know, in that we were um, in the lower middle class and, and uh, uh, able to, uh, uh, um, you know, do the, um, live a, a very good life. Um, you know, I recognized early on the importance of, uh, uh, of education and that uh, uh, this is uh, something that needs to be pursued. And I, I think this is a common thread in in many uh, new immigrants that there's a feeling that uh, in order to uh, be successful in the new society, you have to do much better than, than uh, uh, people of that uh, uh, culture because you will, you know, life will be harder for you. And I, I'm not convinced that that's especially true in Canada, um, but I kind of grew up with the idea that I needed to work hard. I needed to work harder than my friends and, uh, uh, and realized the importance of, uh, of schoolwork. I was always drawn to sciences. And interestingly enough, in, in my high school, I never thought um, of uh, uh, medicine. I was uh, uh, naive and uh, a bit of a romantic. And I don't know if you remember at that time, <laughs> Jacques Cousteau had a regular show on. I remember. I remember. A biologist would be the cat's meow. You know, that's. So that's what I I, uh, I thought I would do. I liked uh, I liked science and I liked uh, math and chemistry. And so I said, you know, I'm going to be uh, a marine uh, marine biologist. Now, again, interestingly enough, when you look at uh, uh, parent parenting today versus parenting when uh, you and I were growing up, I've got many years on you, but. You know, when, uh, but you know, the 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 involvement of parents was much less, and so I had hadn't even thought about university when our guidance counselor called us in, called me in, and said, "Okay, you haven't listed your three university choices," <laughs> um, and I hadn't even thought. So I said, "You know, I listed the two universities in in, uh, in Ottawa." And then I remembered one of my friend's brothers went to this place called Queens, and, and it was out of my hometown. So I said, perfect, I'll, I'll list that as well. And for a marine biologist, it wasn't the smartest choice to choose the <laughs> most landlocked uh, university you could. 
And I had no idea if they offered any kind of uh, course in that, but I ended up at Queen's in biology um, and, uh, and and quite enjoyed my undergrad years, And but discovered that I wasn't crazy about botany. And so after about uh, a third year, switched to life sciences with a, an interest in pharmacology and uh, finished my undergrad degree and pursued um, graduate work in, in pharmacology. So, so still at, at that stage, you weren't really thinking medicine. I, I wasn't really. You know, when I finished my, my undergrad and I was thinking pharmacology, I thought, well, you know, maybe I could do it from uh, a, a medicine uh, uh, avenue as well. But I thought research would be uh, a very good path, and uh, I stuck with, with that route. Okay. And, and so when, when did you start to hone in? I, I'm assuming that's during your PhD then. You started to, to, to think more and more about medicine. Exactly. It was early on in, uh, in my research. Um, I started, uh, uh, I really enjoyed the research, but I felt that uh, I, I realized I also liked the teaching a lot. Um, and I saw the, uh, the, the clinical gap that existed. So I was working on the neurochemistry of Alzheimer's disease. And I realized that there was a huge clinical gap that I was missing. Um, and it would be so helpful to have the entire picture. Um, I also saw the, the value of uh, uh, the MD uh, when you do research because uh, uh, so many MD PhDs were uh, um, getting the grants and, uh, and linking the clinical and, and research work. So it was really in my first or second year um, of research that I thought, hmm, you know, medicine would... Uh, definitely be a good route. And so I applied in my, uh, um, in my, uh, um, at that point, I was still about halfway through my PhD. Um, and, uh, and I got into the University of Calgary Medical School, which is, it was a school that really appealed to me because it was Mac-like, it was a three-year program, and much more focused on uh, current issues in medical education. Um, and uh, so I went to Calgary, and, and at that point I had done, I only had a few experiments left and um, started my medical school as well as, as writing my, my thesis. So, um, so, so walk me through your, your medical school experience. So was it, uh, you know, the, was it what you expected um, or was it, was, it, was it a total shock to the system? I mean, especially coming from a PhD, I think, uh, you know, it's a little bit different than coming from an undergrad degree directly, right? So, yes. Yeah, I think, you know, I think uh, um, it was a wonderful experience. Um, I, I quite enjoyed uh, uh, medical school, but it was interesting to see um, uh, the start of uh, uh, almost an imposter syndrome. There was, uh, I remember um, recalling feelings of, uh, well, am I really smart enough to, to, to be doing this? And uh, um, so there was a, a tremendous amount of pressure from myself uh, to try to prove to my, myself that I had to excel at all these courses. I could learn all this material. And of course, it's a, a huge volume of material to, to learn. And, uh, and there was always that nagging feeling in the back that, gee, did I, did I fool people? Am I really the caliber <laughs> that... That uh, one should be, and it, and it, and it's so interesting now, having spent my entire career uh, in academia. Um, it's amazing how prevalent that imposter syndrome is uh, in our in our medical students, in uh, our residents and fellows, and in our staff. And in, in my junior faculty, the feelings of inadequacy, the feelings of. Uh, um, having fooled people that they really aren't the <laughs> academic professorial types that fooled people up uh, to this point. Um, and I, I think it's something that's probably quite prevalent everywhere. I see it in my kids in their undergrad, where uh, you know, I remember one time talking to my daughter and telling her, you know, she was studying psychology at McGill, saying, uh, you know, I was looking at her mark. I said, oh, you did pretty well and at this and this, and why don't you do this? And she responded by saying, Dad, you just don't get how bright 
students are here. I'm, I'm nowhere near as bright as everyone else in my class. I said, how do you, you know, how can you even say that? And it was truly felt by her. You know, we had the, the, a lot of work to try to break that, that fallacy. I don't know that I ever did with her, but. Uh, yeah, no, it's, I, I, I think it's, I think it's very true. I mean, I go back, you know, being, you know, I'm sure you go back to the very first case that you sat in the chair for. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if it was with Sandy Watson or not. I can't, I don't know, if, but it was, uh, you know, when, when you're in that chair uh, and, and for the listeners out there, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's a very daunting experience for the first time that you're actually in the chair uh, doing cataract surgery. And it's like, uh, you know, your hands are shaking and, you know, you, you realize, you know, a small movement to the left or the right by, you know, a few degrees will make a difference in this person's visual uh, world for for the next twenty or thirty years, it's uh, it can definitely be daunting, and so I think that I mean I think that is a universal feeling, you know, in in anything that you're starting, whether it's your residency or medical school or attending or uh, or even when you're attending and you know things change, uh, you always uh, that that's a feeling that I don't think ever ever goes away really. Yeah, and, and so you know one one bit of of, of advice that I work to any any student. Um, it's very interesting as we uh, um, as we grow up, you know, we 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 often in our teen years and and in our twenties, uh, we we think we are unique as individuals that we and and this is good to to believe that you carry a, a skill set and a personality that is truly unique. Um, what you discover when you get to to my age is that. As, as a species, we're actually very predictable. Um, and, and as a culture, we tend to think very uniformly. And if you thin that down from species to culture to, to uh, uh, a university setting, studying a certain um, uh, a discipline, the thoughts you have, look around you at the rest of the class, and I bet you about 80% of the people are thinking the same thing. Never, never feel that you are um, uh, by yourself in, in, in especially negative thoughts. And uh, you count on a significant number of people around you having similar thoughts or similar feelings. And I, and I think this is getting out. I think more and more you're seeing undergrad students and medical students discussing many of these issues and, and discovering that many of them share these feelings looking at ways to overcome. Now, now, so you've, you had a, an excellent medical school experience. Is there, is there any, you know, if you look back now, is there, you know, a patient interaction that, that you, you know, were involved in that not only you learned from in terms of the clinical realm, but also was important for you on a personal way that, that maybe changed the way you looked at something or, uh, you know, changed uh, changed you in in some way. No, I I wouldn't say there is one specific interaction that had a profound effect on me. But I can tell you, you know, because I came from neuroscience, um, and it was neuropharmacology my research was, and uh, I, I really felt I wanted to continue this path of of research. Um, I always thought that uh, I would do neuro neurology. Or neurosurgery, and so and and I was drawn by the surgical side of things. So initially, I thought neurosurgery might be a very interesting route. Um, at that time, there was uh, uh, a resident who I knew through uh, friends in neurosurgery, and uh, I remember running into him once in, in the medical school, and I said, "You know, we know these common people. Let's have coffee sometime." Um, and uh, we sat down and had coffee. And he was having a miserable time in his training. And when I told him that I was thinking of neurosurgery as an option, um, <laughs> he <laughs> literally cleared the table between us and said, let me tell you one thing, do not ever <laughs> do that, that specialty. And of course, it was due to his circumstances at that time. He was completely consumed by the residency and uh, finding it tremendously difficult and coping with one and two call and horrendous hours. 
Um, but that had a big effect on me. And uh, I kind of decided at that point, maybe neurosurgery was not the best choice. And so naturally it would be neurology. Um, when I got, and, and I always found that neurosciences was the most uh, uh, intellectually stimulating aspect of, uh, of medicine that uh, uh, we did in our, in our classrooms. When I, when I got to the neurology uh, wards um, and uh, uh, clinics, I enjoyed, again, the intellectual exercise of diagnosis. Um, but was so disappointed to see the lack of therapeutics. You know, yeah. you, you, you basically couldn't human condition. Um, and there was very little you could do beyond. And so it was, a, it was a big disappointment. Now, as part of my elective time in neurology, I spent, I had a chance to spend a day with uh, a neurologist who practiced neuro-ophthalmology. I had never heard of neuro-ophthalmology. Um, but I can tell you that after a day of seeing patients with this individual, um, I totally fell in love with, with ophthalmology. First thing you realize is that the brain, about 50% of our nervous network is linked to vision or yeah. eyes in some way or form. Um, it had the same intellectual interest and, and level of stimulation as uh, uh, um, I found neurology and the neuro neurosciences. And then uh, at that time, so this was in the, in the late 80s, we were just seeing an explosion of all these therapeutics, lasers in action, um, microsurgery in action. Um, and so I thought, this is fantastic. It has everything. It has, uh, um, has the, the, the uh, uh, brain links. It, has tremendous therapeutics, it has medicine, it has surgery, it has diagnostics. And so that was a, a, a profound insight. And so I actually, after that day, spent two weeks with him doing a different elective. And after that, started doing more ophthalmology electives and, and decided that's what I wanted to pursue. Now, now one thing, um, okay, so then you did your uh, residency in Ottawa. Yes, and uh, and, and t take me through, take me through that experience because I, obviously I was at Queens roughly at the same time and uh, you, you you guys had uh, some pretty impressive mentors uh, along the way so I'm interested in just hearing your thoughts a you know what that residency program looked like in terms of what it you know how, how the impact it had on you maybe even beyond the kind of technical skills and, and be just a discussion maybe of some of the some of the mentors who were there who were influential in your thinking. Well, I think, you know, at that, at that time, um, um, there were some excellent clinicians in, uh, in the department there. And uh, so it was quite an opportunity to, to work with a, uh, a variety of uh, not only very astute uh, diagnosticians and uh, um, surgeons, but also some very compassionate Individual, so it was it was good to see the, the uh, patient interaction. Um, there, um, there was a, 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 a variety of uh, subspecialists uh, at that time. Not certainly the same extent as uh, we have now, but we certainly had um, many of the subspecialties present and clinics in those subspecialties. So you got experience in. In those uh, uh, subspecialties, uh, um, Brian Leonard was a, a, a established as a, as a retina surgeon, and this was relatively new um, over the the previous decade to see this kind of work uh, happening. And in the OR, uh, George Minsoulis was quite active in, uh, in uh, corn. Uh, David Zick and uh, was doing neuro ophthalmology at that. Uh, at that time, along with Jim Mount, who was uh, quite a, a, an icon in, in Ottawa, uh, not only from neuro-ophthalmology, but from um, his passion for, for uh, uh, interacting with individuals and treating patients as, as a whole. Um, it was an interesting time because when I started, 
that the, uh, there was really no geographic full-time ophthalmologist in the hospital. Uh, everyone had a practice, private practice outside, and would come in to do a half-day clinic uh, once a week or once every two weeks. And the residents functioned inside the hospital and would interact with these part-time physicians. Um, about halfway through my residency, Bruce Jackson came from uh, Ottawa, uh, from Montreal to uh, take over the Ottawa program. And it was just at the time the Eye Institute had just been completed in, in Ottawa. And so he took us to a very new model uh, where his idea would be that there would be minimal part-time involvement um, at the academic center and that the majority of the involvement would be with full-time staff that were localized at the uh, Eye Institute on a full-time basis. And they would, they would also not only be driven by uh, clinical practice, but the other pillars uh, of uh, academic uh, practice, which is research uh, quality and, uh, and education. And so it was a very interesting transition. It's a politically charged time as uh, any time you have uh, a new concept and new ideas uh, uh, coming in, um, and um, and that had a, a a profound effect on me because uh, I had a chance to see the initial difficulties of trying to uh, switch uh, a system in the manner that uh, Bruce was doing it, but also to see the uh, successes that that system met with and what that meant uh, as far as uh, education, what that meant as far as clinical service, and what that meant to, to research. And it was very, very successful. He was quite innovative at that time. Uh, I think I did a, a lot of uh, learning. I also saw the, uh, the sometimes very difficult politics that exists in medicine uh, when you have <clears throat> people having different ideas on how um, the medical systems should uh, should function. And in fact, I, I was so concerned about those uh, those politics um, that uh, I thought maybe uh, private practice in a small community would be uh, the best route for me. And in fact, that's the route I chose after my residency. But I think I'm an academic at heart. I was <laughs> pulled back uh, pretty quick. And, and, and for those, you know, for those people who are residency, you know, who are starting to have those, um, you know, the dialogue around which path to take, you know, should I be going the academic route? Should I be a clinician scientist? Should I be, you know, just go purely into, into clinical practice? I mean, you've had your foot in, uh, in both camps, really. Um, you know, what do you see as maybe the pros and cons of, of both of those and, and ultimately where you sit now? Why do you think you were a good fit for academic medicine? Well, I think <clears throat> there's definitely big pros and uh, um, and there are cons to each, each path you take. Um, academic medicine often means that you work in a group setting. Uh, and whenever you work in a group setting, it means that you don't have full control over the variables of your practice and, uh, and other aspects of your professional life. So if you're sharing a clinic with 10 other clinicians, um, you'll have a difficult time canceling a clinic on a, or trying to rebook a clinic on a whim or deciding that you uh, don't like some of the staff and you want to... Uh, change personnel and so on. There's much less uh, control in, in, in those aspects. So in private practice, uh, you have the option of, uh, of having complete control over your own office because it might be just your office or you might have one or two partners um, that are like-minded in, in uh, what, what you do. Um, there are also uh, uh, university centers and academic centers tend to be uh, flooded with uh, uh, referrals, emergencies, consults, and so on that uh, might put a little bit of an added pressure um, on uh, the academic route. But you, you see a similar thing in, in private practices as well, especially if you're in a, a 
smaller, medium-sized community that doesn't have an academic center present, and you really do have to, um, uh, to deal with things. Um, I've, I've always found that in an academic center, being around uh, residents, I think, keeps you fresh. Uh, there's a lot of cross-pollination and a lot of learning that, that happens with the residents. The idealism um, seen through uh, a young physician's mind uh, is something that is, is always a pleasure uh, to see. To see them uh, um, <clears throat> develop their skills and graduate is very similar to seeing your own children learn to become uh, functional adults in, in society, and that's a, a very big pleasure. Uh, have, uh, different variables in your practice in academia. So it's not only clinical, but you have research and teaching, other things, administration, leadership opportunities that you might not have in, um, in community practice. These things make uh, a practice interesting, but they can also be sources of tremendous stress. Uh, they can be sources of uh, time sinks that take away time from your family or your hobbies or other things that you want to do. So it's really deciding the things that you enjoy in life and how much time you want to dedicate to your career and um, going that way. Now, you obviously have a, a, you know, a lot on your plate. You've, you know, you've got your clinical side, you've got your administrative side, you do some research, uh, and then you obviously have your hobbies and you know, family life. So, uh, I mean, you know, one of the questions that we get asked a lot is, you know, life work balance. Um, so is there any, do you have any tips for today's medical students on, on just how to get it all in or, or just kind of your general philosophy or even how you execute on a day to day basis to be really efficient? Yeah. We, you know, I still haven't figured out this whole life work balance, but <laughs> actually I have Sanjay, you know, I think, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I think one of the uh, big aha moments for me, when big light bulb went on for me, was realizing I always thought that work-life balance meant, meant that you had to come up with a way to make things 50-50, or you had to come up with a way to equalize the amount of time you dedicate to your life outside work and your work. Um, and that's the farthest thing from the truth. I think what you have to decide as an individual is how much time you're willing to spend at work um, and, and because that gives you a certain amount of pleasure in life for whatever, whatever reason. Um, and, and then ensure that the time you dedicate to your life outside of work works for you and all the other individuals in your life. And so what you might find is that it's, uh, it might be 80-20. You might spend 80% of your time at work and only 20% of your time outside work. But if that works for you and you're content with that um, and it works for your spouse and, and your loved ones and the other people in your life, that, that that's enough time to, to accomplish the relationships and, and interactions you need to, then, then that's the ratio of your work-life balance. And, and you'll have balance doing it that way. What usually happens is that people spend far more time at work than uh, they're comfortable with, or their spouse is comfortable with, or their kids or their uh, other uh, individuals in their life are comfortable with. And that results in, in, in an internal conflict of feeling that um, they're missing out uh, or they're hurting their uh, life outside of, of work. So I think, I think you have to decide how much time is correct for your work. And then you have to ensure that you choose a path that will allow you uh, to spend that time. So if you decide you only want to work half time, it's very hard to run uh, half time, to work half time and do uh, academics. Um, except if you're willing to say, that I accept that I'll be earning a lot less, but I'll still dedicate uh, a lot of my time to research and teaching, and that's all I'm going to do. So it's 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 deciding to balance the uh, clinical you want to do, the, the 
the amount of work you need to do to earn what you what you want and sometimes that's another thing that confounds things people get especially when you're starting out your practice and you're in debt and you see that by working hard you can earn more um, you get consumed by that and very hard to step away from your clinicals you really need to decide how much time you need to spend outside work and in work and find a work situation that fits that i find now um, our kids are all grown up and out of the house um, and so i don't have activities um, needed in, in in raising uh, a family uh, my wife is a physician as well and so uh, we're both content you know working much longer days now and eating for uh, you know, a, a light meal at, at 8 or 8 30 at night um, and there's no need for a big meal prep and to be home for the kids after school and, and so on so my work i spend most of my time at work now and uh, i'm very happy doing it and, and i think that's like that's one of the key messages though is uh you know you have to know exactly what you want. Like it, it takes a certain amount of, I don't want to say maturity, but but uh, you know maybe wisdom to get to that point to really understand what it is that you want and what you're content with. Uh, and I think the other the other important thing that I learned was um, it's okay to say no. You know, so the, the, there's going to be a lot of things that uh, you know demands on your time, or people may want you to speak in different countries and here and there. Uh, but if it's if it's not really congruent with what you want to be doing internally, then it is okay to say no, and and I think that frees you up, you know, to follow what you're really passionate about. That's a superb point. Yeah, yeah saying, saying no is is very important. Yeah, and it's I'm actually happy to see. I think I think the millennials um, actually are, are much better at saying no um, than than we ever were. Much to my chagrin. <laughs> <laughs> Many times now, I'll walk away from my residents or, or junior staff and say, I would have never said no to, to my chief when I was at their stage. And then I think, well, good for them. This is exactly what they have to do at this stage. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, I think that's good uh, in a lot of ways, as long as they've thought you know, uh, about the why that they're actually saying no for. I mean that was that's the only caveat that I would offer. I mean sometimes if it's a if it's a knee jerk reaction to, you know, uh, I mean that that would be my only concern. You know. Yes, <laughs> and and also there's a yin and yang to everything. And as you know, you know, saying no does open up uh, uh, a door as far as time and balance, but it sometimes can close doors as far as opportunities and perception. I think that's very, very true. And it's funny because, I mean, I, I just I just wrote a, a little piece on this in terms of, uh, you know, I, I sort of titled it what what two very different mentors taught me, um, uh, you know, in my residency. One was incredibly precise. And, you know, you and I trained in the in the time where we did extra capture uh, cataract extraction and, the, you know, the five sutures going in, the perfect tension, you know, it leads to zero cell. Uh, and and I had another mentor who was much more rough and tumble, and it was all about innovation. And it's like, you know, sometimes you have to go through these hard lessons, uh, you know, working incredibly hard to come to, you know, on the other side, these 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 truths and realities, you know. And so that's the the one thing that, you know, I, I sometimes you know tell tell my kids and uh, you know their friends is sometimes you have to go through these really really hard lessons, and it's. It's not necessarily the technical skills that you learn, but it's more about what you learn about yourself in the process. That that really is the uh, is the important learning lesson, you know. Very true. Very true. Now, now you've obviously uh, you know had a, a storied career and and done a lot of uh, you know great great things in your in your career. And I, I I love to to hear your thoughts on on advice that you'd give to your you know, 25 year old self, you know, if you, if you had to, to do it all over again, what's the, uh, you know, what's things that, what are a few things that you might, might tell yourself? Um, you know, I think I, uh, we've covered many of the things. One of the things is, is the idea of, uh, of work life balance and that it's, uh, you need to work that out with your family and the important people in your life and 
you decide what, where your time can be spent. And if that works for you, that's, that's the, the right time. I think, um, I, I think it's, uh, I would, I would uh, probably tell myself uh, to take it a little bit easier on myself. I think we tend to be uh, our, our own worst critics. Uh, I think it's especially true in, in medicine. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, we need to be uh, uh, a little bit easier on ourselves as far as expectations, uh, accomplishments, um, and, uh, in, you know, each individual success that uh, you're looking for. Um, I think those would be the, uh, the, the two biggest things. Um, I, think, uh, I think I've always had a, a reasonable view. I have never um, you know, expected to, I never had huge expectations of myself and my career. I'm delighted at how things have progressed, but um, if you take things uh, one day at a time and, uh, and uh, you know, I think, I think, uh, you know, the whole concept of mindfulness has become very cliche nowadays. You, you can't, can't take three steps without hearing someone talking about mindfulness, um, but it is really an important thing to, to be in the moment just find pleasure in, in every moment you, you can. As you know, in, in medicine, it's so easy to ruminate over so many things and so many variables we have going and so many patients that we've treated and uh, uh, how successful was this, this surgery or, or this decision or I have to do this paper for next week or so on. Um, and sometimes we could be having a wonderful moment and really all you're doing in the back of your head is going through these horrible things that are coming up this deadline and that deadline. Yeah, so I, I would uh, really work at Mindful. And I think both you and I are not too bad at, at being, and, uh, and, and, and it's amazing when you look now at how you can really put aside these things that could be catastrophic to <laughs> other people and, and we can set them aside and, and enjoy whatever is happening. Now, one last, uh, one last question. So I, I know, uh, you know, you're, you, you've, uh, you've also had a variety of uh, interests outside of medicine from playing guitar to painting to, you know, some, some great restaurants. What, uh, you know, what, are you, what are you feeling very passionate about right now? Um, well, you know what I'm doing these these days that's very different for me is I've gotten into um, triathlon. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's through uh, uh, our good friend, Peter Curtis, who yes, has yes. looked at sickness about, uh, about, <laughs> about, about running and swimming and biking, but he's kind of... Uh, got me into doing these things, and uh, I've been doing more of those, and uh, and and really enjoying it. Uh, well, time in my life, I've actually you know ran as something running was something I never used to do, and uh, it's, I've just found such pleasure that I can still do this, and I can do this better than I ever did when I was uh, thirty. That's wonderful. So, I'm sure it'll only last another six months. And then <laughs> old, but I'm enjoying it in the moment right now. Awesome. Well, Sharif, it's been a uh, an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, you know, I think there's a, a wealth of uh, uh, of knowledge that uh, and expertise and wisdom that the students can uh, can learn can learn from. So it's uh, thanks so much for making time during your day to to have a chat. Well, thank you, Sanjay. Always a pleasure to to chat with you. Great. So for the, uh, for the viewers out there, that was a, a wonderful discussion that I had with uh, Dr. Shreef Aldafrawi from University of Toronto. We're working on a number of shows uh, coming up in the, in the next few weeks, so make sure to subscribe. Uh, feel free to drop us a line if there's specific questions that you want us to be asking our guests, and uh, it's been a, a pleasure uh, uh, doing this show. Thank you.